and welcome everybody to this celebration of our 2022 and 2023 graduates. And I think an especially warm welcome to those graduates from our MLIS program, our MARA program, our informatics program, our teacher librarian program, and our most recent degree, Bachelor of Science in Information Science and Data Analytics. You all worked very hard and earned your degree. And it's no small feat, as I know you all had a lot of other things going on in your life. And now with that, I'd like to pass it over to our Master of Ceremony, Dr. Anthony Chow, the School of Information Director. Thank you very much, Linda. And again, we appreciate all of your hard work and commitment in making uh, all of this a success. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anthony Chow, the Director of the School of Information at San Jose State. First of all, uh, to our graduates in the class of 22 and 2023, 20, my hearty congratulations on your graduation and significant accomplishment and milestone that you have achieved tonight. We're extremely proud of you. I also want to share that tonight reflects an iSchool first and significant moment in our history. Our first ever graduates with the Bachelor's in Information Science and Data Analytics. Congratulations to all of you. The SJSU iSchool continues to be the largest and one of the most influential iSchools in the nation. We're projected to grow by 5 to 10% in the fall, and this year's class will move us to close to 12,000 graduates in 49 states nationally. For the MLS degree, over the past two years, we represented 13% of all of the nation's MLS candidates, and we're also number one in all racial categories, both in terms of total number of students as well as the total percentage of those students nationally. This includes 36% of all MLS candidates that classify as Hispanic and Latino nationally. Quite an achievement. To all our graduates tonight, 375 this semester and 758 for the entire academic year, we raise our glasses in celebration of you. Go forward and help people work hard and be successful in both your personal and professional lives. Never forget that you've joined close to 12,000 SJSU high school alumni worldwide, and we'll also always be here for you if you need us. And uh, I'm sad to say I've got a coffee mug to, to salute you, so cheers to all of our graduates. Using your reactions icon, let's also give a loud virtual applause to all of our dedicated and passionate and committed faculty and staff who work so hard as well to make tonight possible for us all. So thank you again for all of you, all the faculty and staff. Let's also do the same for your family and friends and all who've supported you along the way. Thank you so much for supporting our students uh, and, and making tonight such a success. Tonight, we're delighted to have an all-star lineup of speakers to share a few words of wisdom and congratulations with you. But before we do, let me share a few thoughts. This past month, I've written articles and given talks on a number of information-related topics, including digital preservation and archives, advocacy, and the future of libraries. Let me share a few highlights from each. The iSchool is working on an IMLS grant with the Northern Cheyenne Tribe called Seeking Immortality, where we are helping them record their language and select cultural artifacts. We visited it with them a few weeks ago, and one of their highest requests was simply to help record stories first and foremost, that every unrecorded lifetime of experience that is lost due to, the passing of a, due to the passing of an elder is a significant loss to us all. Our long-term vision is to seek immortality for their native speakers and community leaders by taking full body scans of them and then using AI and chatbots to have virtual avatars that look and sound like them and can hold conversations with future generations hundreds of years from now. It is my belief that this will become a core service of libraries, the recording of stories and the use of AI to immortalize ourselves so our great-great-grandchildren can meet us someday in the future, long after we're gone. We must help others preserve today and the past for tomorrow. From an advocacy standpoint, as both individuals and advocates for our own work and institutions, it all comes down to articulating our and your own worth within the context of organizational and societal goals. As Alan Inouye, LA, ALA, American Library Association, Senior Director of Public Policy and Government Relations said, when he, when he said it, or he said it best, 
that really advocacy is a professional responsibility for all of us, and we cannot and should not leave it up to others. We effectively advocate in three primary ways, build long-term relationships with peers and decision makers and their staff, so they're meaningful. there's a meaningful understanding of what is important to each other within our own personal and cultural context, and also so that disagreements on singular issues do not become relationship breakers. Discussions and dis disagreements are held at a human level and define who we are and the immense diversity our nation represents. Always be respectful and polite in building and maintaining these relationships. Two, have multiple points of data on why what you do and what your organization, organization does is value added and has high return on investment. If you don't have the data to share with others, then you immediate, immediately lose credibility in the eyes of decision makers. And three, gather and share stories of impact with a particular emphasis on patron customer stories of satisfaction and success due to your service programs and resources. Also, one final note, the majority of funding is local. And so if you ever wonder if, if, if you can rely on a state or national advocacy committee that represents you, the answer is no. Local funding typically is over 90% of funding. And so all of us must advocate for our own worth and what's important to us and how that is aligned to the organizational, societal, short and long-term best interest. Finally, the libraries of the future. First, they'll be data-driven and community-centered. In our disrupted world, libraries are being used more often than ever due to the fact that digital access is increasing much more rapidly than print circulation is declining. Access to data, especially visualized data, is essential in helping us make informed decisions as real time as possible. Also, decision makers really like to see this type of data and visualized data in particular. Second, however, is that no one should be taking the value of libraries and information for granted as lack of support for libraries is usually not due to real opposition, but rather that other services are in higher demand and are higher priority for future funding. Remember relationships, data, and stories of impact. Third, libraries of the future are going to be even more high-tech than they already are. And as hard copy print materials continue to decline, the born digital data and job competencies that go with them will significantly increase the digital divide between the haves and have nots. And finally, libraries will continue to provide equal access to high quality vetted and peer reviewed resources, services, and programming. In the era of increased censorship and book banning, libraries serve as the freely accessible foundation for access to open information for everyone. We just now have many more diverse ways to do this. As we celebrate all of you tonight, the field of information could not be more exciting and turbocharged. I hope you're excited about the endless world of possibilities your SJSU iSchool degree affords you. And my final advice to you for success in your career and life in general is to work extremely hard and be kind to others. You must give to get. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to introduce our Associate Dean, Sandy Hirsch, for our Dean's Address. Sandy, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the College of Professional and Global Education, I bring greetings and congratulations from the Dean. As the former Director of the School of Information and the current Associate Dean for Academics in the College, I am particularly thrilled to be here today to congratulate our graduates of the School of Information. Through your course of study in the School of Information, you have all gained a deep understanding of how information can be applied to address some of the world's most challenging problems. And you have also gained the skills and knowledge that will enable you to make a difference in your communities. I congratulate the School of Information's outstanding master's degree students who are graduating with their MLIS, MARA, and informatics degrees and also to those who have completed their teacher librarian programs and certificate programs. And as you've already heard from um, Dr. Chow and Dr. Main, we are very excited to be celebrating our very first class of undergraduates who are graduating from our college. This is a huge milestone achievement and we're super excited. So we are especially wish to congratulate those who have just completed the iSchool's new BS in information science and data analytics degree. 
With While today marks the end of one segment of your career journey with the completion of your degree, it is also just the first step in what we know will be a rewarding, inspiring, and impactful future. I am excited to see what the future holds for you, and I know that you will go on to achieve great things. Congratulations and all the best of luck to you in your next adventure. Thank you, Sandy. And also want to give a special shout out to Sandy for her and Dr. Main's work and really uh, creating all at the iSchool is uh, today. So thank you for all your work, Sandy. Um, okay, now we are going to have a special video from the 2223 president of the American Library Association who could not be with us today. She's a very busy woman, uh, but she is uh, the um, uh, Lessa Kanani Opua Palea Lozada, who is the adult services assistant manager of the Palos Verdes Library District, Rolling Hills Estates, California. Uh, and so she wanted to, uh, she pre-recorded a special message to you. And so, uh, uh, Alfredo, are we ready? Hello, San Jose State University School of Information graduates. It is such an honor and a pleasure to congratulate you on completing your master's degrees. I know that this journey has not been an easy one. Whether you began your degree before or during the pandemic, you made a commitment to libraries and our communities in the bleakest of moments. And upon graduation, we'll be entering the library world in one of our most challenging times as we advocate for the freedom to read for all. Our shared core values of intellectual freedom, social justice, sustainability, democracy, and more are what garner me when times get tough. And as you all enter the next phase of your career, I hope they garner you too because we know that we are on the right side of history and that we will not allow a vocal minority to strip us of our freedom to read. Our communities love and trust us and we are here for them. And I wanna thank you for making this commitment to our communities and thank you for making this commitment to our profession. Our profession is strong because of individuals like you who understand the power of collective action and the impact we can make when we work together. When I graduated with my own master's in library and information science, I had no idea what my future would hold. I mean, I thought I did, but the opportunities that opened up for me were beyond my wildest imagination. From programs I was able to put on like elephant and piggy parties to recataloging indigenous mythologies from the folk and fairy tale sections to the religion section, to giving back to the profession through associations and helping to develop our next generation of leaders. All of these opportunities and more, I hope you also remain open to. Because remaining open to harnessing your power and the wisdom you bring to your jobs to see what impacts you can make in the least likely of places will be the most rewarding. And please know that the American Library Association and I are here to help you harness that power and explore your careers in whatever direction they take you next and the direction after that and after that and after that. We are here for the entirety of your career and beyond. We are so proud of you all and can't wait to see what you do next. Ho'omaika'i, congratulations. Lessa is such an amazing speaker. And Lessa, if you're watching this, thank you so much for taking the time to give our graduates a warm uh, congratulations. Uh, okay, our next speaker is the K the Ken Haycock Award for Excep Exceptional Promise that goes to one of our students, and that is uh, Max Gonzalez Burdick. Max, thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be celebrated for my accomplishments as both a graduate student in the high school program at SJSU and as a leading information professional. I want to start by thanking Dr. Anthony Chow. Dr. Marianne Harlan, Dr. Mary Bolin, Dr. Ken Haycock, the committee, and the entire School of Information faculty for this prestigious award. To me, the Ken Haycock Award means being a leader in my education, in my career, and in life, to take initiative in creating library programs and services that are essential in developing an intercultural communication between people of all walks of life and in promoting a rich understanding of diversity in the best measurable way. 
My passion for libraries started at an early age where I would go to the libraries after school and I would just do my thing and, and, and work with my colleagues. My passion for libraries uh, was extended when I attended UC Davis and I received my bachelor's degree in both English literature and communication. After college, life took a turn and I became a reserve deputy probation officer and a social worker for five long years. It wasn't until my fifth year that I started volunteering at the local public library that I knew I had to change careers and start from the bottom up. And so I was hired at the military libraries in the Marine Corps Community Services as a library technician, which was a big change, but a change in a risk that ended up being the most rewarding as I was promoted to library branch manager. I was doing all of this while being the blog director for the Special Library Association student chapter, applying for many scholarships and working on my master's in this wonderful iSchool program. I want to give a special thank you to Dr. D for listening and understanding my willingness to want to work and gain library experience and for offering me a start at the Special Library Association. It was here where I was able to learn about the many different types of libraries and to showcase my blogs to students at SJSU. I would also like to thank my spouse for always, always supporting me in every step of the way, to my parents who have instilled in me the importance of education from the very beginning, to my sister who led the way and who actually just graduated last month with her own master's degree as well. I was raised in a socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhood to the point where my family and I had to bring our own lunch to places like Disneyland. So for me, this graduation is a magnificent achievement and one that I am very proud of. To see where I am today and be able to help my family has been gratifying. I'm sharing the story with you because I want you to know that it's okay to take big life-changing risks and to focus on what you love to do. If you put your all into your goals, then the rest will follow. My next goal after graduating is to put my focus on utilizing $100,000 from the headquarters at Marine Corps to redesign my library, purchase new furniture and a brand new circulation desk so that our library can become the best place to visit for active duty who are serving our country. Now, I would like to congratulate my fellow colleagues who are here today and to share some words of wisdom. When I first started working as a library manager, I was given a phrase from my boss's boss that I always look back on whenever I'm working. The phrase was to always lead by example. Leading by example means setting the standard for expectations and in showing others that you are putting in the work and are overachieving. It means being able to delegate work, inform and teach others with kindness and be a team player. I would like each of you here today to take this message with you, to lead by example, to be brave, to take risks, to protect the importance of literacy and to advocate for intellectual freedom and the right to equitable and inclusive services. As a first generation Mexican American and a member of the LGBTQ, I cannot express how important it is to be a leader in this field and to show the importance of standing up to censorship. I want to encourage you all to continue working on your dreams, whether that's to become a librarian, an archivist, a museum curator, an information referral specialist, or whatever it is that you would like to do. Within a short three years, I went from being a volunteer to managing my own library. And that's a remarkable experience that I took upon myself with a lot of hard work, sacrifice and determination. It's also very fulfilling to know that my efforts are rewarded and appreciated. And I hope that my venture is an inspiration to you all. If I could give one last advice, it would be to do everything that you can to apply, apply, and apply to as many positions that are available. If you don't have work experience, then start volunteering now and add that to your resume. 
And when it comes to working, show others that you are loyal, dependable, and a hardworking leader because a good reputation is what's going to propel you to new heights and to be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. We're so proud of you and thank you very much for those inspirational remarks. Our next speaker uh, is uh, a welcome home of sorts. Uh, Michelle Pereira is the Director of Library and Recreation Services for the City of Sun Sunnyvale and also an iSchool alum. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, graduates. First of all, before I say anything, congratulations. I am so proud of the work that you've done and getting to this momentous occasion. It's such an amazing accomplishment. And, you know, as I was thinking about what to say today, and I'm truly honored to have been asked to participate today. So I was thinking about what to say. I thought, you know, I could tell you all about myself that, um, you know, I, I've been working in libraries for 30 years, that I taught for SJSU, SLIS for seven years, that I am from Sri Lanka, that I'm an immigrant, uh, that I'm a traveler, that I am uh, unabashedly a crazy cat lady, but I thought I would rather spend my time talking about some of the lessons that I have learned in my years in the library profession and hopefully just impart a few things on you that you can walk away with that will hopefully help you in your career. And I've really kind of divided it up into two things. One, the work we do every day for our on our jobs, serving our community and whatever kind of community that is. And then the other piece of being a librarian, and that is our profession and how we have an impact on that profession and how we serve that profession. So I really want to make sure that I try and get to all of these. I've got like a little top 10 list that I'm going to share with you. And uh, I'm not really sure if you can see it, but I'm wearing my Leave League of Extraordinary Librarians shirt, which was the uh, theme of my presidential <laughs> conference. So um, I'm really proud of it. And let me start with number one lesson that I've learned is start early and build your brand. We talk a lot about branding in the commercial um, sector. We talk a little bit about it in the public sector, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your own individual personal brand and the importance to establish a strong brand. It is equally important. For me, when I started thinking about this, I thought about what my brand actually is. And I asked people around me, hey, what would you say are the three words that would describe me? And then I thought, what are the words that I want to be, that I want people to use to describe me? Where do I want to get to? And what do I need to do to get there? And the words that reflect my brand are the words innovative, strategic, uh, someone with a vision for the future, uh, trustworthy. That's really important to me. And then also someone who believes in my team. Those are things that I find really important and I do everything to try and maintain that brand. This didn't happen overnight. It took years to build. And the importance of spending that time building that brand is you're really building brand equity. So inevitably in our careers, we're gonna fail at something. It's going to happen. It's okay. I'm here to tell you, it's okay. I have failed at many things, but that brand equity is what saves you because people look at you and go, that's not who Michelle is. She's all these other things. And they look past that failure. They help you get through that failure. So really think about your brand image and think about perhaps what three to five words you want to reflect who you are and start working on that and building who that, that's who you're going to be. The second thing I will say, which is just as important is be strategic. There are so many things to do all day long. We do not have time to get through everything that we need to do. So you have to be strategic in your decision-making. Think about certain projects or services or pick things that are going to help you get to where you want to go. So for me, I wanted to try and have as much impact as I could, both in my community, through my job, and also in my profession. And as I thought about that, like, okay, what can I do to achieve that impact? So as a, I was probably a librarian one or librarian two in the city that I worked for, I volunteered to help out with the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. 
And the reason I did that is because all of the training, all of the meetings that revolved around that were conducted by our city managers that put me in front of the right people. And it allowed them to see what I was capable of doing. And it gave me a lot more latitude, a lot more experience, and a lot more potential for upward mobility in that organization. I also thought about the impact I want to make on my profession, which is equally important to me. And so just like Alessa has made a huge impact on our profession through the American Library Association, I decided to work with the California Library Association and try and make an impact that way. And, you know, it might be small, it might be large, but I spent the last 15 years volunteering from, you know, working on a conference to doing a program to being on the board and then being the president. And all of these things really helped me establish my brand and who I am. So those two go hand in hand. The third thing I will say is, and this was mentioned a, a few minutes ago, lead by example. It may sound cliche at times, but it's so true. We have to be able to walk the talk. You know, you can be a leader in any position. You don't have to just be a leader. You don't have to just be at the top to be a leader. You can lead from anywhere. But the important thing is think about those qualities that are important to you as a leader. Who have you seen? There's several people who are on here right now who are major leaders in the library profession and think about the work that they've done and what they stand for. As you look at those characteristics and those traits, that's what you want to try. And if you want to embody those, You've got to walk that every single day and be that person. That's what other people are going to see. And it's so important to do that. Leaders have vision. They are strategic. Uh, leaders in their organizations build a culture of trust. I can't emphasize how important that is. They inspire creativity in other people. And, and that is such an amazing thing to do, to be able to bring something out of someone else and empower them to be able to do things on their own. And they really are able to get people to follow them and follow them in their vision that they have. And those are all big things, but leaders are also, they illustrate that nothing is beneath them. They're willing to do whatever it takes. And that sometimes means, and I am definitely one of those people who at the end of a large event at my library or my recreation department, I am going to be the first person to help pick up a chair, fold a table, or pull down an easy up and load the truck because it's important to stay humble and it's important for your team to see who you are and that you are willing to lead and do anything it takes to support the group. Number four, the next thing I'll mention is be innovative, be creative, um, reinvent something that's so exciting to do. There's the business guru, Peter Drucker, who once said, the only way to predict the future is to create it. Let that settle in for a minute. That means taking a risk. That means trying something perhaps you haven't tried, but it means creating something that perhaps never was. And that is just one of the most amazing things to try and do. So I encourage you to take the time to innovate, take the time to iterate, to trend watch and think about how you can change the way you do things or perhaps do something new that ne has never been done. Year, a few years ago, uh, my former boss was the president of CLA and he asked me to be his conference chair and he said, hey, um, really quick, come up with something for conference that's never been done before. And I was like, oh, OK, let me let me come up with that really quick. And I thought about it for a while and thought, what hasn't been done at conference? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of things that take money. So that was off the table. So I said to him, hey, what if we, instead of stopping like we do normally at conference at five o'clock, what if we went all night long? And he was like, oh, hold on, that's a lot. And I said, okay, what if we run till midnight or one o'clock in the morning? So anyway, out of these discussions came the night track at the California Library Association conference, which is super popular. And the first year we did it, I did a program at 10 o'clock on a Friday night on failure. And I had 200 people in that room wanting to listen to those library directors talk about a failure they had. It was an opportunity to do something different, something edgy, 
we knew there were lots of new librarians coming into the profession who wanted to spend time together, who wanted to socialize, who wanted to be out later than five o'clock, who wanted an, a bar. And so we provided all of those things. And that night track is still going on today. In my job, when I was the director of the Rancho Cucamonga Library, um, actually this is when I was the assistant director, we had started introducing toys into the children's room, which most libraries have done. And one day I was at a museum and I saw this uh, geography exhibit that it really captured me. And I thought to myself, as I was coming home, I thought, wow, what if we were to create some kind of interactive exhibit for our children's room that featured all of these different kinds of toys or different kinds of play and tactile experiences. And we got a grant to do a proof of concept, hired a museum designer, and we created these interactive exhibits that were scalable, that were small enough for, for a, a library to use, and that were flexible and movable and all of that. And they were the most popular things at our library. And what was great was all these other libraries heard about it. And we ended up selling like 50 or 60 of these museum exhibits, really, that worked in libraries to other libraries. And it was great to be able to create something that wasn't and introduce it into the library world and really try a different type of service model. So the bottom line is, look around you all the time whether you're at the grocery store, whether you're online at the gas station, whatever, there are so many places that you can look and get inspiration. You just have to always think about how could I apply this to what I'm doing at work or what am I doing in my profession and think of that way to translate it. And that will really give you a leg up on a lot of other people who don't think like that. Next thing I'll say is pay it forward. Everyone here, who's spoken today has had someone in their career or probably some ones who have been remarkable and done something great for them. I know I've had great mentors in my, my career and I am so grateful to them. They've helped me on my journey and they've really helped me, you know, through their generous spirit become who I am today. So I would say, you know, be a mentor one day, get involved with an organization like Lessa has like ALA or like I did with the California Library Association or PLA or Reformer or Apollo. There's so many. Become a member, volunteer, and give back to our profession and to the next generation of librarians as you go on in your career. Like I said, I volunteered for many years in uh, for CLA and I've never regretted one minute of it. It's really been very fulfilling. And it's important for us to really make sure we're giving back to our profession. The next thing I'll say is ask yourself a question when you're faced with issues. Is this your hill to die on? There are so many things that you're going to come up with. In, and I, I, when I was you know, just starting out, I really felt like everything was a problem. It's like I blew up everything. I made it bigger than it needed to be. And if it's just the usual routine stuff that's bugging you at work, you know what? That's why we get a paycheck. Let it go. We have so many other hills to die on. Lessa mentioned some of them that we really need to focus on as librarians. And you guys are coming out of library school at such a great time. You know, we're in this post-pandemic world and we are really reinventing the way libraries are getting used because people's, the way people do things has changed. The way we eat, the way we pick up food, all of that has changed. So, and libraries have too, and our traffic has. So you're coming out at such a great time to do that. But some of the things that you're going to have to really take the mantle on is freedom to read. You know, I cannot believe we're still having this conversation about banned books in 2023. I mean, this is ridiculous, but this is something that we are dealing with. Sustainability for fun, funding sustainability in libraries is something huge. And that is something that we really need to think about. You know, when you look at an organization like a city or a county and you're funneling so much money into public safety, and I'm not saying that's not important, but the more money you put into libraries and community services and zero to five and after school programs, the less money down the road you're going to have to put into public safety. That is proven. So that is something else that you're going to have to contend with as you're coming out of this. And I will say librarians have been talking about equity since God was a child. I mean, we have, this has been part of our language forever. I've never known it not to be. And now the rest of the world seems to have 
jumped on board about equity and diversity. But it seems like whenever we take a step forward, we're taking steps back when it comes to diversity and LGBT. And we need to really make sure that we are on the right side of that in libraries. So all of these things, so my message is really think about, is this your hill to die on and which ones are you gonna choose? Uh, the next thing I'll say is have a nimble career plan. And I say nimble because you wanna be able to move and bob and weave as you need to when new opportunities come up. There's, it's always important to have, even if it's a one-year plan, that's okay, or three-year, five-year, even a 10-year, it really doesn't matter. Just have an idea of what you want to do, the skills that you're going to need, the training you're going to need to achieve that. It is so crucial because things will happen, and it might not happen right in front of you where you think it will. It might happen over there, and you have to be always thinking about, gosh, will that get me where I want to be? How? Decide on the kind of impact you want to have in your in your life, in your job, in your profession, and think of the look for the opportunities that are going to give you that. For instance, do you want to supervise or manage? What training or skills are going to make you more marketable to get to that role? What can you volunteer to do in your job that's going to give you what you need to then be competitive for that next job? Do you want to be a director? I'm hoping some of you do. Um, but it's not for everyone. But what I would encourage anyone who's interested in really moving up and becoming a director and trying to affect change is to not stop at being a director. Please, if you hear nothing else, should we hear this? It is so, if, as a library director, I am given a pot of money to spend every year. And if I want more money, I've got, you know, I've got to do a lot of maneuvering to try and get it, or I've got to fundraise, or I've got to go to my friends. I wish I thought about this earlier in my career is think about what's beyond a library director. If you can become an, a, a city manager or a county CAO or the director of a school or the dean of a school or of a museum, these are the decision makers that decide the, where the pots of money go and who gets it. That's where we need more librarians to go. We need you to move up into those decision-making roles, even into those political roles, because that is what's going to make a difference and give libraries far more power than we already do. So if you hear nothing else, I hope you hear that. The next thing I will say, and I'm sorry I'm moving quickly, but I want to get through my 10. Please celebrate success. I cannot emphasize how important it is to celebrate success. You all need to celebrate this accomplishment that you have just achieved. It is remarkable. It is important. And you need to take a moment. And when I talk about what you've got right now is true success, and it's huge. But success is also trying. And that is something that we sometimes forget about the importance of celebrating someone who tried. What one thing we try and do and I try and do is whenever we do some large staff report for city council or get something that's almost across the finish line, we celebrate turning in the grant application, never mind that we get it. It's important to try and celebrate those accomplishments because that's a, it was a heavy lift for people. So think about celebrating the try as well as the success. It can be simple. It can be a, hey, thanks so much, great job. It could be a, a handwritten note. I will tell you, a handwritten note goes a long way. Or an email or a cupcake or a cookie or a party. One of my proudest moments in my career was 10 years ago, my library won the National Medal, and that, which is given out by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And we got to travel to Washington, DC, and Mrs. Obama presented my library with this National Medal. Talk about like the eclipse of a career. But and as great as that was, the most exciting thing was the week before we had a huge party to tell staff we had won and we invited anyone we could think of that had some kind of influence, other library people, people in the community to have a party and just celebrate the work of achieving that. So really think about the importance of celebrating those wins. And then sometimes I will say, take time to reflect on those special moments in your career. Sometimes we 
We've all had one of those days. We may have had many of those days where we have self, self-doubt. And, you know, quite frankly, maybe we're throwing ourselves a little pity party. I know I've done it. It is in those moments that I take time to reflect on some of the special moments in my career. Obviously, the National Medal was, you know, one of those. But I remember probably about 10 years ago, I ran into a former student of mine who wasn't sure what she wanted to do. And she went through our class, uh, which we taught reference. This is how long ago this was when it was required. And we taught a reference class and she came out of that class feeling she was gonna be a public librarian. And when she ran into me, probably five, six years after she graduated, she saw me and she literally threw her arms around me and said, I just wanna thank you, you changed my life with that class. And that is a moment that when I have a bad day, I look back on and think about. I think about the time when we had this huge Black History Night celebration with about 500 people at the library. And this one mom came to me with her about five-year-old son, and she said, I never had anything like this growing up as a child, and you are changing these children's lives by doing this. And I knew the importance of that program to her and her family in that moment and how important it was to keep doing programs like that. And I will be really honest with you. I graduated Oh, gosh, I finished in 1996 in December, and I graduated um, at the ceremony in May of 1997 from San Jose State. And this is when we had the split campus and I was down south. And I, I will tell you that it is full circle for me to be able to speak to you here today. And this moment right now will be one of those moments that stay with me that I will look back on. So I thank you for including me today. And I thank you for listening. I thank you for selecting librarianship as a calling in your, in your life. I wish you all a career filled with success, with fulfillment, and with a little surprise. Congratulations, graduates, on your graduation, on this momentous occasion. And I will leave you with number 10, my 10th tip. And that is something that I was told on my graduation day by someone very important to me and wrote it down on a little card, which is still on my refrigerator 27 years later. And he said, and I'm saying this to you, do great things. Thank you very much. Michelle, uh, this is a speechless, uh, incredible job. Thank you. I would love to follow up with you about getting your top 10 list. Uh, I would I'd love to share that on our website. Uh, we're so proud of you. Thank you for coming back and sharing all that you, you've done and all that you've learned with our new graduates. Um, I thank really appreciate for, it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. We're honored. Uh, I also want to just a couple of notes about your top 10 list. Be a role model and walk the talk. Love it. Create the future you want to see and be part of. Love it. And also celebrate, especially that you tried. Uh, this uh, fantastic. Thank you again, Michelle. Thank you so much. So our next uh, presenter is John Clay. So uh, moving on, on to the other side of information, uh, he is Vice President of Threat Intelligence for Trend Micro. And John, we appreciate you taking a few minutes of your time to share all that you've learned uh, in your illustrious career. Thank you, John. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here. And uh, I'm very humbled that you allowed me to speak to the, to the folks. So congratulations to all you graduates. Um, when I started in school uh, a long time ago, uh, we didn't actually have courses in cybersecurity or IT information technology. So it's been it's been so cool to see uh, the university and education industry uh, take this up because it's it's definitely needed. So I want to talk a little bit about my background and and give you some of the journey that I've done. I've, I'm 27 years in cybersecurity. It uh, feels like I just started uh, just the other day, but it's been a long time. Um, my background is I'm from Michigan, um, went to Michigan State University and got a BS in, in electrical engineering. 
what's interesting, I had a minor in computer engineering with that, and I actually never used my double E degree. So I never got into electrical engineering as a profession. I ended up taking some computer classes. Uh, and interesting enough, my first computer course was Fortran with punch cards. A lot of you probably have no idea what that means, but uh, basically you had these punch cards and you had to feed them into a machine and it would come out with a, and it was your program. And I can't tell you how many times my rubber band around my, my punch cards broke and I lost my whole program because they were all out of order, but uh, it was fun. So I actually, when I graduated, I graduated in 1987 uh, from Michigan State, and uh, my sister was working for a company out in Sunnyvale, California, out where you guys are. And uh, she said, hey, we need a programmer for a um, program we have at this at work. So she got me my first job, uh, and I did a computer program, uh, computer engineering and, and computer code. So basically, I, I programmed in zero and ones. Uh, so it was I did that for about three years. And I found out, again, I wasn't really cut out to be a programmer. Um, I sat at a desk for, you know, all day programming. And uh, I just kind of learned that I didn't want to do that. So I shifted jobs at that point. And, you know, Michelle talked about being nimble in your career. And so I'm actually probably like Gumby um, because I've, I, I'll talk about it, but I did, I've done a lot of different jobs uh, around. So I took that, uh, I took a job into with a company and I got into sales uh, of computer uh, equipment. And my background was in Unix. Um, so I started selling Unix uh, servers and PCs and all that uh, for that company. And I kind of did that for a number of years, uh, moved around for a couple of different jobs. Uh, but then it was interesting enough, I was out of a, out of work for a little while. And I had just um, I'd met a, a lady who uh, eventually became my wife, but at the time I was out of work. So I, I figured I, we were going to get married and I said, I needed to get a, a real job again. And I looked at an ad in a newspaper. Most of you probably don't even look at newspapers anymore, but back then this was in 1996. Uh, I answered an ad in a newspaper for a company that was looking for a salesperson. So I went and did an interview uh, and this guy, a gentleman named Jim Leonard uh, looked at my background, looked at my resume and said, hey, you've got a good technical background. Why don't we need an, a sales engineer? And um, and he's like, would you do that? And I was like, well, I'll do anything. I just need a job. <laughs> so he ended up hiring me as a sales engineer. And I was the second sales engineer hired in North America for my company called Trend Micro. Uh, Trend Micro has been in cybersecurity since 1988. Uh, so I was very early on. We're 35 years. I've been with them now for 27 years. So I know I'm probably atypical for most people these days who move from company to company to company. I did that early in my career, but then I started with Trend Micro and I've been with them for 27 years. Now, one of the reasons why I've stayed so long is one, that's a great company. I've, I've loved the people there. I love the owners. In fact, our founder, uh, one of our founders is, is our CEO, uh, Eva Chen, uh, which again is atypical in, in technology, having a female CEO. Um, our company has a lot of diversity. We are a global company. So uh, that's the other reason I, I love working with Trend Micro because I work with employees that are all over the world. We work in 65 countries around the world. So I get to interface with you know, the Japanese, with the Indians, with uh, people in Canada, with people in South America, Brazil, China, you name it. Uh, I've been able to work with, with people I know. So it's been a fantastic uh, opportunity for me. But inside, I was a sales engineer and I started working and doing stuff. I did some sales engineering management. And I, I want to share a, a, a lesson for you because I had a little hiccup in my career at Trend Micro. And what happened was I, um, I was a little upset with my manager and I had a friend uh, at work that I, I used to, um, he still actually works with us too, uh, and I vented to him via email. And unfortunately, that email was addressed to my boss, not him. And so my boss got this email. And I obviously, uh, at the time, I didn't write uh, a very flattering uh, look at, at what he was doing at the time. 
And uh, so, you know, life lesson there, if you're going to communicate to somebody, make sure you are communicating to the person you are, you are supposed to be communicating with, but also, you know, um, suck it up. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, it was a, it was bad manners uh, on my part, but we all get frustrated at times. Um, but just again, take time, sit down, take a deep breath before you to vent too much. Um, so unfortunately at that time, uh, I wanted to stay with Trend Micro, but I knew I was not going to further my career under this person. So I decided to move into marketing. So it's interesting. I went from a technical role, sales engineering role, into the marketing side. And uh, my nature is kind of an introvert, uh, but uh, I've always enjoyed public speaking. So I started to do a lot more public speaking at that point. I they would have me go and do events and I would speak on about cybersecurity at events and stuff. And that, and so I became a product marketing manager and I actually launched a, a number of different products for us over the years. Uh, and then I, I got into the education side. So this is interesting because uh, you all are remote learning and uh, this is back in probably 2000, I think. Uh, I started to build a um, remote learning program for Trend Micro to train our customers so, um, on, on the products that we had. So I, I built a virtual classroom. I built, we had virtual um, machines and we ended up, you know, and I had instructors that were teaching virtually. Uh, and so we kind of started the whole remote learning type of process there back in 2000. And, and that worked out very well. And it was an interesting, again, it was change of a job. It was a new, new thing to do at the company. And it was, it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed that. Um, but then I, I started to get into more and more into the public speaking stuff. And so actually today I'm, I'm basically a public speaker for Trend Micro. I, I speak at conferences all over the world uh, about cybersecurity. Uh, I, I regularly talk about the threat landscape out there, uh, what the, the, the malicious actors are doing out in the world. And so it's been a, a, a lot of fun to me, and especially traveling around the world. Like I said, I've been able, you can't see a lot of stuff on my walls here, but I have, I have stuff that I've picked up over the years uh, as in my travels uh, to be able to to reminisce and, and memories. And I would recommend that you do that in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, routines, that if you do go somewhere, take some time, take an extra day to go visit. Uh, interesting story, I was in Cairo uh, for an event. Uh, we have an office there. And uh, I was able to actually um, get some, some time off and I I did I did the pyramids and I I did uh, a, a Nile dinner on the Nile, um, a whole bunch of things. But what was interesting is um, actually I went to a Coptic church uh, where Jesus and Mary had spent time when they were in in Egypt, and the next day a bomb went off at that Coptic church, uh, and then about about a day later, another bomb went off. So I had two bombings happening while I was in there. My, my manager, uh, director at the, at the time there, uh, took me aside and said, Hey, we got to get you out of the country. Uh, and I did not disagree with him. So I ended up taking off, but that's just one story of many that I could tell about, uh, travels around the world. But again, it's been fabulous to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, you know, so so being cybersecurity gives you a lot of opportunities. So they asked me to talk a little bit about success, and then I'll talk a little bit about the industry itself. You're, I will just tell you right now, you're for, for you that are going into cybersecurity or IT, it's a fabulous industry. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, but it is a fabulous industry, and it's going to continue to grow. But um, a couple of things that I learned in my in my uh, years in cybersecurity. First and foremost, I made a promise to myself early on that if somebody asked me a question, I was going to get back to them. I may not have had the answer at the time, but I got back to them quickly and I said, you know, I either I gave them the answer right away or I said, hey, I'm going to be able to I'll, I'll find out that answer and I'll get back to you. And I've kept that commitment for 27 years now with Trend Micro, and and I've got a very good reputation inside the company uh, that people realize that I will follow through on on any asks. And I know, um, and so I would recommend that that's a, something you think about doing. I, it, it can be 
difficult at times because you can get a ton of requests coming your way. But as long as people know that you you received it and you've heard them and you are going to get back to them, they will uh, they will actually help you out if you ever have have a need of their services as well. So that's one thing that I would recommend for sure. So be nice, and then you've heard over and over, be kind, right? Uh, Dr. Chow talked about being kind, and that's a, that's the second thing that I've I've done is I regularly will thank people. I will um, praise people when they do good work. Uh, all of that is going to be uh, is going to help you. I've been a little different in my career. I've never really um, strived to be an executive. Um, I've been kind of a, a worker bee, so to speak, uh, over the years. Uh, part of that is because when I, I started with the company out in San Jose, and then they allowed me to move to Colorado. I'm currently in Colorado, and I work out of my home. I've been working out of my home for 23 years now. And they allowed me to do that. Another reason why I've stayed with the company. So they let me have let me work out of my home. Uh, and that's been a fabulous opportunity for me, but it does come with some challenges. So if you ever work from home, I will give you some, some tips there. Uh, first and foremost, uh, in technology, we a lot of us do um, desk work. So we sit at, at the computer for long periods of time. Uh, and I will say after 27 years of doing that, the body, it takes its toll. And health-wise, I would recommend regularly getting up from your desk, walking around, doing stretches, whatever it might be. Uh, I've done a lot of phone calls and, and video calls, and I do those standing up. I've got a, I'm standing at a desk, I got a stand-up desk. So I've done that um, as much as possible, but you have to move. You've got to move because the body does not like sitting, being sedentary for for long periods of time. And I and as you know, what I found is that you can get in that groove and you can start getting on your computer and you can next thing you know, it'll be three hours before you look up and you're like, I haven't done anything. And you have you've just been sitting at a desk for three hours straight. So, you know, whether you use a a, a clock, an alarm, or whatever it might be, just I would recommend moving. Um Another thing is uh, willing to work. You've you've heard this a few times. I actually, as as a public speaker over the years, I've missed numerous anniversaries. Uh, my wife and I just celebrated our 28th year anniversary, and uh, I had to miss quite a few of those uh, because we had events came up and I had to go out of town. Uh, but I was willing to do that work, and and you know we had a good. My wife's been fabulous over the years to understanding that that my career is important and and uh, need to to you know have a, a give and, and take on that. Um, so you know do that work as much as you can. Um, you know you you heard uh, earlier Michelle talking about it. You know, identify what you want to do. Do the priorities as much as possible. Um, you know, you can get wrapped up in a lot of minutia. Uh, so I would definitely recommend using. You know, there's lots of tools out there that can help you uh, in your in your day to day operations, so to speak, uh, to help you do what's what is most important uh, for work wise. Um, another thing, I would definitely recommend everybody learn to public speak. You may not like it. I was, like I said, I was an introvert. Um, when I, I'll tell you, my first speaking engagement was awful. I, I stuttered, I um, hem, hum, you know, the whole bit. But, you know, I've been doing it for, you know, 20 plus years now, speaking in at conferences, speaking in, in meetings, whatever it might be. And it, it will definitely benefit you in your career if you can relay what you want to relay to somebody outside or somebody you know that you're talking with so learn to do that public speaking if you want to get into public speaking i know there's a lot of businesses out there that look for people who can talk for them uh, and it's like i said i've had a great time doing it it's an enjoyable job um, another thing is take time for yourself uh, michelle talked about this earlier but but i'll reiterate that uh, you can get wrapped up in work and it can take a lot of time up in your life and and it can be difficult um, because you have to take some time off. Uh, you know, luckily we have um, we have 
uh, we call it PTO or vacation time at work here. Uh, I'm able to do that on a regular basis. You know, it doesn't have to be a week all the time. You can take a half a day even uh, or, you know, or take a day, but um, do something to get you away from work. I would also recommend social media, take a time out of social media. As we all know, uh, you can be on your phone 24 seven, basically following social media stuff, but that's, that's that can suck you into an area, and it's and unfortunately, in many cases, it's it can be some negativity in your life. So I would recommend uh, taking time off of that as well, and that that really helps. Um, you know, the other piece, like I mentioned about moving. You know, if it were first thing in the morning or at lunch, go take a walk. I did that numerous times, even when I worked in the office in San Jose. I would just go out and take a, you know, take a 30 minute stroll at lunch hour and then I'd come back and eat a sandwich or something and get back to work. So, but take time for yourself because it will help you mentally. It will help you physically. Uh, all of that will be, will be beneficial to you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity. Obviously, you're graduating with a, uh, IT and IT and, and cybersecurity. This industry is unbelievable. Um, I actually work on the vendor side. So a lot of people may not realize that there's basically two, two sides to cybersecurity. One is you can be a practitioner where you're actually defending networks and systems against the malicious actors out there. But there's also the vendor side where like with Trend Micro, where we actually are creating products to help businesses and people to protect themselves. Um, our mission statement at Trend Micro is you know, to um, uh, ensure that uh, the uh, transfer of, of digital information around the world is safe uh, and and we've we've followed that model for for 35 years now and continue to do that but there are so many different jobs available to you as i you know just in my own career like i was saying i've been in sales i've been in technical sales i've been in marketing i've been in the education side i'm now in the public speaking side so you know and even among that there's a ton of different opportunities that you can do uh, with organizations. On the practitioner side, there's numerous ways, areas you can look at. You can be a threat hunter uh, where you're actually looking for the malicious threats that are coming into the organization uh, or, or in the business. Um, you, can, you could be a vulnerability um, uh, expert. We have a, 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 what we, a, a organization called Zero Day Initiative that's a bug bounty program. We pay out millions of dollars a year to people who find bugs in software. And uh, so that's a, a career you could look at if you wanted to get in that. We just had a, a, a bug bounty uh, contest in, in uh, Vancouver where two uh, researchers found bugs in the Tesla uh, infotainment system. And we paid them out $250,000 for those. And Tesla gave them the car. Uh, so, you know, kind of interesting. Now, that's the that's the really cool aspect if you can get there. But, you know, again, that's work. Uh, there's a lot of work involved in that. But but you can take this industry and really kind of hone into what areas you like as a person. Um, so if you do love, you know, marketing, you can get into marketing. If you love programming, you can get into programming. Uh, there's so many opportunity out there for you. I think last time I, I I saw there's over 3 million open jobs in cybersecurity around the world. It can take you to other countries if you want, uh, especially because, you know, the, again, there's, uh, I think the U.S. has under a million of those jobs. So there's over 2 million jobs uh, around the world openings for cybersecurity. So if you want to just to go do something outside the world. The other aspect is is in the industry is is it's very diverse. Uh, as I mentioned, our CEO is is female. Um, we've got you know people from all over the world, uh, every race, every every gender, you name it. Uh, it's it's a, the, the industry is very nice in that perspective. So um, it, don't limit yourself. Uh, you can take it to any level that you want. We all know that artificial intelligence is is coming on big. We've been actually using AI and machine learning since 2005, so over you know 15 years of uh, of working with that 
technology, but now with chat GPT coming out uh, and some of those technologies, large learning models, um, if you wanted to get into programming uh, AI, that's going to be a massive opportunity out there. Uh, and probably some very, very lucrative payment um, paying jobs if you wanted to get into that, because again, it's new. The, bit, the best thing I've loved about this industry is it's constantly changing. I'm learning something new every single day uh, that that ha that occurs, whether it's through the technology that's the new technologies that are coming into play, or the malicious actors are doing some new tactic that uh, that tries to circumvent the the security products that we we um, we utilize. And so it's it's been uh, enjoyable for me because it's kept me young by having to con constantly learn education. And that's my other point to you is if you do want to succeed, get that education, you know, that learning. Um, uh, you want to be constantly learning new things. And the beauty of it is with the Internet today, you can learn anything you want. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times on I go to YouTube now if I have to do something uh, on my car. I've got a 2000 Jeep Wrangler that breaks down all the time. I, something breaks down. I go on YouTube and somebody's already t uploaded a, a thing on exactly how to fix it. And, uh, and, you know, so you can learn that there's learn new skills constantly and that will help you in, in life. Um, and it also help you learn what you like to do and what you, you know, what maybe what you don't like to do. So again, your career path is going to be very diverse and can change and, and be, as Michelle said, be very nimble uh, in that. The other aspect of our industry is that it will be here for a long time. Malicious actors, uh, cyber criminals are not going away. Uh, last year, we blocked 146 billion threats for our customers. That's a it was a 55 percent increase from the previous year. So they're actually ramping up their attacks on businesses and 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 people. So you will have a industry continually for the next uh, I don't even know how long. It's probably forever. You know, um, physical crime has not been solved. Uh, we still have physical crime out there, uh, and. Um, and so cybercrime is probably going to be unsolved for a long, long time as well, because these malicious actors are going to continue to, to do what they want to do out there, and we have to protect it. Um, the nice thing about the cybersecurity industry also is we are on a mission. We're a mission to keep people safe, and that's a nice goal to have. Uh, it keeps you uh, excited. It keeps you young. It keeps you wanting to come back to work day in and day out because you know you are doing good in the world. You're doing something that can help people out there in the world. Uh, and and so it's. Uh, I applaud you that you you um, are getting into the industry and you've taken the time to uh, go through the the courses and stuff. Um, I would also recommend as much as possible uh, learning and getting in the practitioner side. So doing CTFs, uh, which are capture the flags, um, doing those on a regular basis to learn, to learn the industry, learn how to do things. Uh, that will definitely help you out there as well. And so... Uh, I hope this helps you all uh, understand kind of my journey. Uh, my journey hopefully has uh, helped you understand what you can do in your life. Uh, it's 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 been a wonderful life for me. Um, I've raised three kids since I started at Trend Micro. I actually just went, uh, we just, per my son just graduated with a master's degree at uh, University of, of uh, Kansas, uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City last weekend. Um, so we're doing the, the we were doing that as well. And I've got two others that are in university as well. So um, you're doing a, you're getting a, into a great uh, industry. You're doing a good job by graduating. Um, I, I wish you all the best of that life has to offer. Um, stay, stay happy, stay fun. Uh, work is can be fun uh, if you make it fun. It can be exciting if you make it exciting. It's all up to you, uh, but I know you all will achieve uh, your dreams and your goals that you want in life. So uh, thanks, everybody. Um, appreciate you taking the time out tonight. Congratulations to everybody. And again, thank you for having me. It's been a very humbling experience for me, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you so much, John. Um, and I want to thank uh, John in particular for 
I've asked him twice uh, to help me in some way. And he said, yes, both times. And I think John lives what he has talked about as far as being generous with his time. And what ends up happening is that, of course, uh, if he asked or needs anything from me in the future, the answer is going to be yes. Right. And, uh, and the same thing with Sandy, Lessa, Max, uh, of course, Michelle, uh, being generous with your time, helping others uh, really um, just creates a wonderful uh, network of, of giving. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing our, uh, their wisdom with us. Let's give them a loud round of applause. I uh, appreciate everybody's uh, use of emoticons to, to provide support for our speakers. Thank you all for being such role models and all the good that you do for so many people, uh, for being people we want to follow. Today is not the end, but rather a significant milestone that serves as a beginning to a whole new world of opportunities and expectations for you and your family. Go forth and do great things. Don't fixate on mistakes, but rather learn from them and become stronger because of them. Don't give up when your goal is to help more people. It's worth the effort, the frustration, the bumps and bruises. Be true to your values and your personal and professional dreams. Go forth and do not let anything stop you from achieving what you wish to accomplish. Push yourself to always learn new things and expand your own boundaries of what is possible. We oftentimes call that running from safety. Also make sure to take care of yourself along the way and your loved ones. Yesterday, I'm proud to say that I was elected vice chair of the National Little Free Library Organization. Good friend, fellow library of a little, little free library advocate and San Diego County Public Library Director Miguel Acosta best identified why his library system is installing little free library boxes across his county, 44 to be exact. He calls it equity of access to library resources for all. So again, congratulations, the class of 22 and 2023. Uh, we now, as tradition, have a student video. So you'll we get to see and celebrate all of you. So please enjoy that. Uh, and again, uh, do not uh, uh, leave. Uh, we recommend uh, staying and then also joining us in our party room, uh, our after uh, graduation party room, where we are unveiling uh, the use of a high-end virtual reality environment. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. And as Bethany said, uh, you don't need any equipment whatsoever. It's just a hyperlink that we're going to share with you in just a second. And I would encourage you to check it out and spend a little time with your faculty and staff and peers. So. <clears throat> 